Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Carvana. Do you dread spending your Saturday haggling with a car salesperson? I know I do. I know Ringer staff members do for a fact because we just had this conversation today. With Carvana, you can skip the dealership altogether and buy your next car online. Choose as soon as next day delivery or pick up from the world's first coin-operated car vending machine. And enjoy the peace of mind of a seven-day return policy. Plus, save some serious money compared to dealerships. Carvana is the new way to buy a car. Check out Carvana.com, C-A-R-V-A-N-A.com slash watch to learn more. Today's episode of The Watch is also brought to you by Redbox. School is out for summer, and Redbox has the video games to keep you entertained. With over 40,000 nationwide locations, you can rent and return anywhere. And better yet, you'll get a free one-night game rental from Redbox when you use the promo code WATCH2. Swing by a box in your neighborhood, or if you want to make sure the game you want is there when you arrive, reserve it online at redbox.com slash games. Offer is valid through July 13th, 2017. Subject to additional terms, charges apply for additional nights, and payment card is required. Getting into video games has never been so easy. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am a writer at TheRinger.com. I'm also an editor. <laughs> you know, I was about to say, I was about to tell the people what was amazing about you. Is are you we are, doing this in the podcast, this is, is it? it? You are a red light player. You can always turn it on. Because a minute ago, you were just in quiet reflection. And then you just went to 11. But I think I got in your head. Chris Ryan, Andy Greenwald. That's it? Yeah. Um, Andy, welcome we, to the we, watch. We finished strong? It's Thursday. Do we, no, let's just keep going. I like this. No, I mean, at the end of the podcast, we give oh, you some yeah, of that good Oh, yeah, I'll just be screaming at the end heat. of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, today, episode of The Watch, we're going to talk a little bit about um, these James Bond rumors that I came across on the uh, on the internets. <laughs> Definitely accurate. It sounds plausible. Uh, Jay-Z's new album, which we haven't heard yet, but we're going to talk about our uh, how, how excited we are for we're, it. We're, we're not talk, excited. We're going to talk Preacher. That's going to be the meat of the show. The meat? Yeah, I what? would say that's the that's the shoulder a- cut. AMC's Preacher. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. I don't know. I'm just trying <laughs> and, to get you excited. Uh, well, you wanted to start out because, Andy, you saw this Inhumans trailer. I feel like we just want to knock this out. I want to talk about this. He, Andy was like, do you want to talk about this Inhumans trailer? And I was like, I don't know what those guys are. Like, yeah. I know it's a show. Yeah. But I don't know how they're related to the MCU. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's chop it up. The trailer for this ABC straight-to-series show in humans dropped. Another ABC classic. Today. Yeah. Um, And it looks about as good as something this ill-advised could look. Why is it ill-advised? So here, here's the story. Paint me a word The picture. Inhumans are a interesting side character group I think created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee in the page of the Fantastic Four like 40, 50 years ago. And they are a race of superpowered people. Are you with me so far? Yeah. I know it sounds far fetched. I got you. I'm they poly. live on the moon. Okay. And oh. they are a royal family. Okay. And the king, whose superhero name is Black Bolt, played in the trailer by your man, Anson Mount. I don't know who that is. I just love calling him your man. I think he was Hell or High Water. I think that was his. Oh, his, okay. His, his John. Um, his voice can like bring down buildings. Okay. Fun fact, Black Bolt's real name is Blackagar Boltagon. That's for real. Did they really That's for real, my man. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And his wife Medusa, that's like the Chris Christopherson of of comic book names. <laughs> his wife Medusa, that's the Anthony Tony. Yeah. His wife Medusa has hair that is strong and can lift things. But that's not what Medusa could do in uh, in, in like no, mythology. Like, that's the thing. The actual Medusa had snakes on her head and could turn dudes into stone. Yeah. That's cooler than a weave that can strangle it, you. Yeah. So my point is they were kind of a sideshow attraction. And then when uh, Marvel started picking up steam and, and doing, you know, going great guns in terms of owning Hollywood, the person in charge of Marvel... Publishing, mm-hmm. Mike Perlmutter, yes, good friend of our president, big supporter. Yes. Um, he just thought people might want to know that as they make their informed choices in the marketplace. He, uh, this is not the wrong move, was basically like, why are we publishing comic books about X-Men when we can't make movies out of X-Men when movies are the things that make us money? Because Fox owns the rights to X Men, and he they wanted to get those rights back, or like you know cross the streams. So basically, in the publishing world, they canceled out X Men. They made them marginalized. 
they put them basically just stop focusing on. They still make X Men comics, of course. Yeah, because they're so popular. But they they went all in on Avengers stuff and made them the flagship of the line. Because gotcha. for a long time, when like when I was when you and I were, well, mostly me, but like comic books, like in the in the eighties and nineties, it was all X Men. It was everything. all X Men. Yeah. So then they were like, well, what can we do? What can how can we make something as popular as X Men but own it? And so they decided that Inhumans was going to be a thing, whether oh, so you like, like it or not. That's like. So they did this thing where the 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 mist that made the Inhumans powerful on the moon was let loose on Earth, and a whole new generation of super powered people that would have been mutants ten years ago are now called Inhumans. And they live on the moon. No, now they live on Earth. Okay. The royal family lives on the moon. Doesn't matter. They have a teleporting <laughs> dog. The point is right. When they un- announced their big movie slate that included um, Black Panther, which looks super dope, which Captain Marvel, which is extremely exciting, they also, in that same press conference, in that big stage, when they announced Civil War there, too, they announced the furthest away movie, like 2019, was Inhumans. And people were like, okay, I guess they can literally do anything, if, including make a movie out of a guy who can talk words I mean, they ma- it made a blockbuster out of a raccoon, so yeah. Right, so you were thinking, but but... What this that announcement actually revealed was this big schism between Marvel publishing and Marvel movies okay. and Marvel TV. Interesting. Kevin Feige, who runs the studios and has pretty much had a Midas touch, saw this and wanted no part of it. Even though it was at his own press conference. Yes. What happened was behind the scenes, either it wasn't prioritized or it was just basically slow slow tracked until it became quite clear that they were not going to make that movie at all. There has been a divide of power in Marvel. They don't no longer have to speak the two arms. And so in the Inhumans instead, still under Ike Perlmutter's purview, have been put into the S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. Yeah. And now they're making this as a TV show. And and that was always an interesting... Uh, it almost it was like, take the relationship that used to happen in the early 2000s between magazines and their websites. <laughs> You're speaking to the choir here. But yeah. where, where they would be like, yeah, you know, like we really want to work together and have mm-hmm. a lot of crossover and then it just wouldn't really happen. That was the same sort of thing that happened with S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and Avengers, right? They were like, Avengers will be the movies and then like yeah. all this cool stuff will happen in we'll, S.H.I.E.L.D. that will inform we'll the Avengers. We'll be the spackle between the big movies, basically. And that did not happen. No, nobody wants... There are already too many um, cooks in the kitchen, let alone managing the continuity of a TV show. So they're all the... The, the stakes of the S.H.I.E.L.D. show have been very much contained to the S.H.I.E.L.D. show and stuff like that. Can you imagine if you went to an Avengers movie and like once yeah. every three years or four years yeah. and then it was just like previously on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? I would just, I would kill myself. <laughs> I would speak the fatal words that Blackagar <laughs> Boltagon could only say. So anyway, so they made the show and ABC was very excited straight to series and um, IMAX premiere. <laughs> Andy and, Green, Waldy Wald. <laughs> and, <laughs> yo, it looks real stupid. Yeah. Like it looks cheap. And silly. Yeah. And they got um, they got our man Ramsey Bolton playing Maximus the Mad, which, by the way, is the only interesting character in the Inhumans because he's the only one that has a personality, and that personality is, I'm crazy. Maximus the Mad. Yeah. Okay. He's Blackagar's brother this who got a like cooler it sucks. name. Yeah. So is the co- are the comics good? I don't know. I mean, the comics did this thing where they basically made the inhu- they forced the Inhumans into every story and made them a force to be reckoned with and made a whole new generation of characters. Like, there's a very cool character that took the name Ms. Marvel, who is a Pakistani-American teenager in Newark, one of the best things they've done in many years. She is, her powers are because she's an Inhuman. So they basically lumped everyone in to make cooler characters in humans. Okay. They, they, they tried to do a thing where, like, they tried to make people who we thought were mutants in humans they weren't mutants anymore like because mm-hmm. they didn't want that to be their thing look the bigger picture is this was a power play and it very much seems to have backfired because this looks silly this just does not seem like in a, a, a juicy dramedy about super powered royals nor does it seem to be like a action extravaganza it's it's your man Anson Mounts and Ken <laughs> Lung from Lost doing like C grade special effects on the streets of is it Vancouver it looks like Atlanta or Vancouver. There is only there are only two places you can shoot something now. I, I, I just think that this is this is obviously a conversation we return to again and again. But there are diminishing returns here, universe. You know, I I don't. I mean, Iron Fist exists, but I don't know anyone who is like I'm checking for that. The Defenders is coming with good performers we like in it, but I don't know if anyone needs it. It was just announced, so it's happening. And when content, and I'm using that terrible word, in, you know, intentionally. Just be, just exists because it had already been announced on a shareholders report. Then you get into real 
get into real trouble. I don't know if an ABC show is necessarily subject to the same rules of cinema that like we expect from a blockbuster entertainment, but something was, you, you had us kind of like, you were pretty down on Michael Bay a couple of days ago on the podcast, right? That hurt you, you a little bit. Yeah, but no, he's just, I, we Some, were Someone tweeted at me and was just like, you know what you should check out? You should check out this book about the films of Michael Bay called Every Shot a Painting. <laughs> it's like well, written, it's written, funny you should say written that. Written by Michael Lagon Bayagon. Like, <laughs> so I was reading this blog post today. First of all, great lead. About Michael Bay's director's commentaries on the DVDs of his films. Oh my God. Uh, probably going to get fired because that was like not really uh, uh, like part of like the most 100 most important things I need to do today. And uh, he has this quote when in the first Transformers. He says this. My theory on effects is that it all comes down to lighting. I feel everyone in their brain has something we don't really know it's there, but we can tell when something is not lit right. And that's the first thing I Hmm. thought when I watched that Inhumans trailer was like, this looks like an Ikea showroom outside of in suburban Atlanta. And it just it's starting to really bug me how this stuff looks. We're going to talk more about Baby Driver next week. And I, I really, really, really enjoyed Baby Driver. I went and saw it last night. But. The fact that a lot of this stuff is being shot in the same two places, either in Vancouver or Atlanta, and the stuff, the fact that I don't know what it is about why everything looks the same, which is basically yeah. like bright but overcast industrial park Atlanta. I, my, my guess, honestly, and I would love for someone to chime in on this, it has something to do with laying the CGI over it. I'm sure that you're there's right. Some, or, or converting it later to 3D or all the things that you have to consider now when you're just filming Right, film. so this thing is supposed or to, to in humans is supposedly shot with IMAX cameras is going to be shown in IMAX theaters, but it's premiering on ABC. It's like, I, I don't really understand the, the, the logic there. They are, and I wonder if this is because they are all one corporate entity but look like there's a character in it named crystal and her hair has like a a one of m night Shyamalan's signs carved in the back of it in black that looks really cool when jack kirby draws that in 1968 it looks extremely foolish when everything is lit in that banal what city is this light yeah you don't need to do that and so my my argument in this isn't that there shouldn't be an inhumans tv show which sidebar there should not be an inhumans tv show but if you're making one and you're making it for ABC, well, then make it a Sunday night ABC show about a bickering royal family who also happen to have a teleporting dog. You right. know what I mean? Like, make it a TV show. Don't make it this thing that was transferred from one thing to another with tracing paper and wasted millions. In other why did you do that news? Yeah. Uh, Jeff Snyder, who who has uh, does the tracking board site, he uh, said something on Twitter the other day about um, – the idea that the Broccoli family, the people in charge of the Bond franchise, still one of the coolest names ever, by the are, way. Low-key cool name. Have they've caught Mr. franchise? Broccoli. They've caught expanded universe fever. The Broccoli's got to keep it moving. You gotta, you gotta get like a little bit of garlic, and you want a little Listen, olive oil no, 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 on no. your broccoli. Let me try that again. <laughs> Do you know what the Broccoli's really love? Cheddar. The That's a classic love combination. For the natural flavor of bro- broccoli to speak for itself. You don't like my broccoli cheddar. That's a soup people like. I like broccoli cheddar soup. It gets very stringy. I don't like the soup. I don't really like soup that much. I want approval. First of all, what? I like pho. I want approval from you for my joke. I like Robin. Your joke was great. Thanks, man. Your joke Go on. Great. Tell me about Franchise <laughs> Fever. Um, can you have an expanded universe for something that's so closely identified with one character? Um, I asked the, sure. the biggest Bond fan I know on staff is Justin Charity, and mm-hmm. he was like, they, they kind of need to based on how convoluted and confusing the Spectre stuff has been over the last couple of movies but and I actually really like this there was a fan theory a while ago it was like the Commander Bond theory that was basically like the actors who have played uh, James Bond over the years are actually separate characters and that they are just James Bond is a code word you know what you don't seem to be or or (laughs) it's a popular character because he bangs chicks, wears tuxedos, drinks and shoots people, and every year they need a younger actor, every so often they need a younger actor to play the part. Yeah. Like, calm the fuck down, Broccoli's everybody. <laughs> things can just be things. You know what I mean? And, okay. But, but, I want to be... But you're, you're making yourself available for the Money Penny Chronicles. Here's what, here's what I'm saying. I want to be cognizant of the world we live in and uh-huh. not just be a cynical crank, which is, you know, comes very easily to me. And this actually will lead into some degree to our conversation about Preacher. And I'll say this. You have to Trojan horse stuff now in Hollywood. If if this was coming from a place of how cool would it be to make a series of films or a TV show about 
Her Majesty's Secret Service. Mike Lee's Q and M. Just well, two guys sitting <laughs> at a pub talking about inventions. Now you now you got me. <laughs> but no, but if there was something about just Her Majesty's Secret Service and uh-huh. it was set in a classic era, um, why not make that? And then what you would do is you if you come to that with real integrity and ambition and creativity, and then you have to, in order to get it made, grab the umbrella or pay for the umbrella from the Broccoli's to say this is the James Bond universe or whatever. Yeah. That's foolish to me, but it seems it's increasingly necessary. What I have no interest in, the Spectre stuff, they've been doing that. That is the franchising of it and the expanded universing of it, and it's dumb and makes no sense. Just as dumb would be the Money Penny Chronicles where you find out, oh, she's his sister, because like <laughs> nobody cares. Let me be honest with you. I, I hope don't it's not his sister. Has anyone I mean that's <laughs> I feel like Thomas Vinterberg's <laughs> Spectre. <laughs> the dogma the version. The dogma version of Spectre. What I'm saying to you is this. It's just Mads Mickelson Let, crying in an empty room. That's <laughs> Hannibal season five. Ask Justin. Ask. I'm asking this to the other James Bond Maybe fans Maybe we get out Justin there. on Thursday. Do you care yeah. about James Bond's parents? Like, not I was, I was kind of into that. That's, you know, in, in Skyfall, they, they kind of touch on, on that. It, the th- reason why it worked to, in Skyfall, I think, is because it was about James Bond, and we saw more about him. But in terms of, oh, well, the secret of his origins, I mean, this was like... No, I'll keep it... Let's keep it 3,000. Let's remember... Andre 3,000 is that Javier Bardem is in Skyfall. But let's also <laughs> remember what why we like this character. You know, there, there was a similar thing, and this is, the, this is the podcast where I'm just going... I'm just doing this, but like... This that's everyone knows Spider Man's origin story because it's a really good origin story yeah, and it yeah. works. I've, yes, and then there was a whole thing. Um, I don't. They may have done this in the second Andrew Garfield movie or the movies, which I did not see. But they definitely did this in the comic books where they were like, "Well, how can we futz this up? Like, what more can we add to this?" And they added a whole thing where his parents were secretly researchers and they were killed, and you know, by and Nick Fury was involved and Shield, and it's like, why? It doesn't have to be that way. The reason things are good sometimes is that they're simple. Um, The reason Jay-Z was good... This is going to be Herculean, if you could pull this off. Is he... Was was it Jay-Z was, like, very much... um, at the cutting edge of like what rap music was supposed to sound like he and this is the same thing that happens to bands all the time to musicians all the time where there's like there's Joshua Tree U2 there's Pop and Octong Baby U2 and -hmm. then there is I don't know how to dismantle an atomic bomb U2 right like they you can't help but growing old you can't help but losing your your relevance that being said even though it is coming out over what appears to be a hybrid of a music streaming service and a tax shelter Attack shelter and a and, and a mobile device company mm-hmm. and a mo- mobile carrier. I'm kind of excited for this J record tonight. Do you do you think Doug is ready for it? I don't know if Doug's ready. That's the issue. Is like, does Doug? What do you think Doug from Titles Day is like today? Here's the thing you have to remember about Doug. Doug's had a quiet couple months, and Has he? it's a holiday weekend, and you know Doug just wants to get out of there, crack some Bud Rita lime drinks. And just enjoy himself. And instead, he's just going to be on call when all the just casual title users who high key dropped the service the second Life of Pablo <laughs> became available on other platforms sneak back just for 24 hours. So, have you seen the track listing? I have not. Would oh, you like me to, to to give you a little teaser here? Yeah, this is coming tomorrow. It's 444. called 444. It's coming tonight. It's, it's supposed to come tonight, midnight, you know, or whenever. Yeah. 444. Some tracks here. Till featuring K. Dot and Mr. West. Okay. Kevlar Tux featuring Andre 3000. Say the name again because it sounds so good. Kevlar <laughs> Tux featuring Andre 3000. Do you hear me coming Hold on board? The cream <laughs> featuring Swizz Beats and Future. This definitely could be made up. Like, an incredible project would have been just fantasizing and making the fake track listing for this record. Yeah. Hold the cream. Chance the Rapper is on here. There's a song called wow. Stones, which I think is about how the Stones are better than the Beatles. Wow, that's a hot take. That would be my my Jay Z song. <laughs> Are you excited for this? One out of ten. Um, now I'm much more excited than I was. What were you at right before I told you the track listing? Six. And now you are. Twelve. Great. No, t- at nine. Look, it's exciting. I hope these songs are good. But it's to me, what's interesting about this is the larger conversation about music and stars getting old in the system. I mean, it is hard to think of a better 
champion hero avatar of the last years of the monoculture, which at the time we didn't even think of as a monoculture. We thought there were many different things happening, but they were nothing like what we have to deal with now. Because what Jay-Z did was he was the most charismatic. He was the biggest star. He had the most authority and presence and gravitas and pull and Rolodex, right? And what he would do is every time he would suit up, you know, not to continue with the Marvel metaphors, but he would Tony Stark it up with whatever was bubbling. Yes. So yeah. he was and like, the, the I know where did that was that more clear than volume three? Where right. I, he That's really what I was did mention. make this this uh foray into other regional sounds that I think people were aware of yes. that were starting to bubble up into the mainstream Bringing by, UGK yeah, on the having record UGK and... using Timbaland, using Dr. Dre in ways that were like it was like a very tribal time at that time where it's like you had your East Coast sound, your Texas sound, your Houston sound, your Atlanta, you know, your Atlanta sound. Your California sound, your, your your LA sound, and like he really did bring a lot of those disparate things together, and that was it was exciting to see what he would do with it. That was, he would he would make the blockbuster version of the art house stuff that you were digging, if that makes sense. And it's kind of, it's such a different era in terms of everything in his place yeah. in it. But if his style is to just sit back and continue, he's always had. Not, not the best, but certainly one of the best ears. He's got very good taste. And so if his move is to just be like, I am going to take my time and I'm going to get in the studio with the very best people and with the best beats that only I can afford, then it's classic time yeah, again. Yeah, and also I would just say that when, when this tour inevitably gets announced, because I do think that for the most part he's putting out records to, to tour, come yeah, up with because a he is a classic tour. rock act. He's so good live. Like yeah. It's so great to see him live and it still feels like those songs... It still feels like 99 Problems came out yesterday. Which is why, I mean, we were having a conversation, you and I, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, about how he was sort of aging. Yeah, right. But always managed to be smarter than everyone else and be two steps ahead of everyone else. And it's interesting that some of the things he might get dinged for in terms of relevance it actually are evidence of how smart he is, particularly what you're saying, which is the only people in music who make money are legacy touring acts. And he smartly spent the last... 10 plus 10, 5, 10 years transitioning into being a legacy hits touring act, right? With yeah. a killer band. He can play Glastonbury, no matter what Noel Gallagher says. He can play uh, Radio City. He can play anywhere. And he's got 20 years of music to draw from. That yeah. people love. Uh, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Then we'll be back to talk about Preacher. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Audible. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. Unlike a streaming or rental service, with Audible, you own your books. So you can access them from anytime, anywhere, from almost any device, including your iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon Fire tablets, or Windows Phone. Plus, Thanks to the Great Listen Guarantee, if you don't like your title, you can swap it out for a new one. Not to mention, Audible channels give you a collection of exclusive originals, short stories, and comedy, so you always have something new to listen to. I know that I've just been really jamming some audibles of Larry McMurtry novels. They're that, very calming. Is and that true? The character actor Will Patton reads some of them. It's just very, like, smooth. That sounds wonderful. And by the way, you seem calm. I know. I just feel like it, it really brings the blood pressure down. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash watch. That's audible.com, A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash watch for a free audiobook with your 30-day trial. Today's episode of The Watch is also brought to you by Hotel Tonight. If you are like me and you are not so great at planning ahead, I've got good news for you. There's this awesome app called Hotel Tonight, and that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the very last minute. It sounds counterintuitive, but unlike flights, hotel rates usually get cheaper at the last minute. And Hotel Tonight helps hotels sell their unsold rooms, allowing them to pass those deals along to you. These aren't last resort places. They are actually cool, top-rated hotels that you want to stay in. And with so many awesome partner hotels in a ton of different countries, Hotel Tonight can help you find a great hotel almost anywhere. It's the perfect for thing for a spontaneous getaway or finally going on that trip you've been wanting to take for a while. I know that I like to use Hotel Tonight if I'm looking for a little L.A. staycation, L.A.cation. If I want to go to the beach, maybe check out the O.C., dip down to La Jolla. What are those, sea lions or, or what, are, what are those things coming out of La Jolla? 
uh, coming out like like, yeah. like like some hot. They band. hang out on the beach. Hotel Tonight will get you there. That's all I'm saying. Because even though the app's name is Hotel Tonight, you can book up to a week in advance. All it takes is 10 seconds, just three taps and a swipe. So get in on these killer last minute deals and download the Hotel Tonight app now. We're back. We're about to talk about preacher Andy. Let's do a little house cleaning. Yeah. Uh, July 11th. We're yes. pl- we're at Largo. You you better say we're playing Largo. We're playing Largo. Uh, we're gonna play all the hits with Mallory and Jason from mm-hmm. Binge Mode, mm-hmm. from The Ringer, from Our Lives, mm-hmm. and we're talking Game of Thrones. Obviously, we'll have some special guests, and hopefully, we'll be able to announce those next week. Yeah, I hope. I'm excited about that. Um, you obviously have probably heard by now, but we'll be doing uh, Talk the Thrones live on Twitter after every episode of Game of Thrones Season 7. And a lot of people are still asking this. Yes, you can watch it, not live. Yeah, like, it'll we will just be, be... We'll be live to Twitter, but when your airing of Twitter's the show great, ends, man. whether just, it's Sunday just or... Just the conversation never stops. Sunday or Wednesday or whatever, you will be able to find this feed of us talking. Yeah, and I wanted to mention a couple of things for the show. Monday, obviously, long weekend... We will have a special show up where Andy and I uh, talk about a barbecue playlist we made for you guys. And I think we're going to put the playlist up before Monday, though. Just yeah, so sure. Can we're just going to we'll do the director's commentary. Yes. The Michael Bay. It's all about light commentary. Uh, attached to that episode will also be a conversation that I had with one of our favorite authors, Don Winslow, who has a new novel out called The Force, which is a. How was the conversation? I was sorry. It was to really it. good. He's great. He's really, really good. Don's got. Um, a lot of stuff happening right now. Did he, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but didn't he, like, last time he came on the show, invite you to go spear fishing with him off the coast of Rhode Island? Yeah, he was like, he's just, he's an awesome dude. He's such an interesting guy. And now he's, you know, he did the cartel. The cartel is going into production, I think, with Ridley Scott. And Amazing. It, there was news that came out a couple weeks ago that his new novel, The Force, is going to be adapted by David Mamet for James Mangold. Yeah, that was one of those things that was just incepted from your yeah, brain. Yeah, I hate when that happens when you're just like, this isn't really happening. Yeah. You know, you, like, you're just like, these are just like four of my my favorite people. Um, so that's for Monday. Then next Thursday, I think we're going to talk about Baby Driver. I'm going to see a movie. I promise you that. We also have some, we were supposed to have a guest today. Um, yeah, we should have him on. We should have. We, we have a guest today who had to go do Seth Meyers' show. <laughs> so whatever, we, um, we forgive him. But yeah. he'll be back hopefully next week. And then that's that's it. Then we're done. Yeah, that's, that's the that's end of the, the podcast. <laughs> How can we top our conversation Andy is about going going uh, to write a spinoff where Miss Money Penny is in the Inhumans? We really can't get any better than our conversation of Edgar Wright's <laughs> Baby Driver. <laughs> like, why, why not quit on a high note? Um, let's try. By talking about Preacher. I'm excited to talk about Preacher. A lot of similarities. A lot of irreverence. Mm. A lot of uh, same Mm. touchstones. A lot of really kinetic, frantic camera work and editing going on in both of these works. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to spoil Allison Herman's take on Preacher. One thing that she and I have been talking about Has she written the take yet? It's going up tomorrow. So Friday will be up. One thing that she and I have... No, actually, I think it might be going up next week. Is she pro or anti? Allison's pro. And one of the things she's pro about is the leap it's made in the season two to season one. I want to talk about that. So let's talk a little bit about that. But let's talk a little. I, I know that you have some mixed feelings about this television show. No, it's not mixed. I just think I have contradictory feelings. They're both strong feelings. Oh, good. Those are great. I think it's important to to, to start by saying I think Allison's 100 percent right that. And this is echoed by a few other critics as well. The show is is better. And I really we let I mean just to to recap like I we think we both enjoyed a lot of the I first really season. I really liked the first season. It was in my top ten. It was a lot of fun, and it had some of my favorite episodes. Yeah, of television that came out last year. But I thought, and I've seen I've seen two episodes the Me second too. season. Yes. I think the those have both aired. Up. Yeah, Sunday it was Sunday and Monday, and now it's moving to Monday nights going forward for the rest of the season. You can get them on uh, title. I think it's. <laughs> You just made Doug's night so Doug's much like, what? worse. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> Was I supposed to put preacher? On? We, we do TV now. Um, it's better, and I think it's better for a simple reason, which was the reason this show is, and we'll get into whether it's good, but the reason it transcends is these are th- three of the. This is one of the best ensembles on TV. The three leads of the show, um, Dominic Cooper, Ruth Nega, and uh, Joseph Gilgan are unreal yes they are so good they they are the best special effect a show can buy they pop off the screen and in the and first two episodes they do something that not enough shows do and as shows go on longer they have to adhere to different people's schedules and they mm-hmm. have to serve different masters mm-hmm. they share a lot of screen time that, together and that's the difference and it's like it is 
it is a big three. Like usually you'll get like, oh, Jack from Lost, but he's out here with yeah. like these other guys. You or know, you'll mix get... and match it for a while where yeah. everyone can carry their own plot and line. And we've talked which before is... about how that's cool. And often a necessity, not just for um, actors who might not like each other IRL, although aren't Cooper and, and Nega dating in real I, life? I don't I know. I cannot are. confirm. Um, you can, not of it, not at this time. Let's ping Juliet. I bet she could. Um, but just to keep the writers a sane basically because you have to keep multiple balls in the air and sure. you want to expand the show blah 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 but or the first cut season balls off as it were in pre sure <laughs> but look this show for its second season was like we obviously have source material and they are and we'll get into this sometimes i think still too indebted to it and enamored of it but well, they're also the thing, like, isn't it this they only okay but they're also saying look enough of this keeping them stuck in one place enough of this sharing screen time let's literally blow up the town from the first season and put these three, not just in a car together, but in one scene, sharing a pull-out couch. And that makes an enormous difference. It makes the show feel as exciting and, as you said, kinetic as the violence and special effects sometimes clearly want the show to be. It's just seeing them together does that. There, I don't know that I am personally that interested in the quest of this show. Which is supposed to be I don't know if the people as, who make it are either, and that's my point. It's but supposed to be read as a that. huge compliment to this show that yeah. I'm so into it. But this whole, like, we're searching, so the the the, the broadest strokes is uh, Dominic Cooper plays Jesse Custer, who's a, a preacher. The, a the whiskey novel, preacher. A whiskey preacher who has this thing inside of him, a gift, a curse, whatever you want to call it. Genesis, which is a power to basically control people's minds with his voice. He, he, I think you could say he has the voice of God, but yep. I know that people will say, well, point of order. He is joined on the road with his girlfriend, Tulip, who he used to do do crimes with, uh, and they've had some, some ups and downs. He wants to do a crime. And then they have their uh, vampire buddy, yeah, um, who's this Irish guy who really likes to get after it and <laughs> he likes to, he likes to get wet from um, a variety of substances and the first season obviously takes place in this town anvil i think it's called which is a great metaphor great. for what it was yeah, around and there's the this neck whole of the show thing with like his congregation and whether or not he can get p- people to believe in god again and what kind of preacher he has to be and there are some angels um and then there are all these like weird flashback slash side stories about a cowboy who is rampaging across the frontier to avenge his off like terribly murdered family uh and and how those things are going to connect and like andy said that they basically hit a soft reset hard reset button by blowing that town up and putting them on the road essentially starting from where i think the graphic novels begin correct the and, and and I should be clear about this i read every single issue of this comic in the 90s when it was coming out i don't remember that much about it Structure. I remember it as a road story. I think I remember it starting in a diner. Yeah, right? I think, and they're, I think like, they're on, we're on the, road. the road. Yeah, looking for God. Yeah, and God has left heaven and is somewhere in America, listening to jazz. And they're driving around looking for him, and they're being chased by this cowboy who's now shown up in the present day, and he is the saint of killers, and he can't be killed, and he's working for these angels. This all sounds crazy. This is just crazy. All of this stuff, right? Yeah, you're just like. Okay, and there's a lot of conversations about it, and you're just like, whatever, man. The thing is, is that they combine this trashy grindhouse meets Sam Raimi meets just grotesque horror meets slapstick comedy meets rat-a-tat dialogue. It's uh, Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Sam Catlin, who I think worked on Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad. Who are doing it. Seth and Evan directed the first two episodes. I think Sam is the showrunner. That's right. And it has so much energy, and I think so much charm that it makes up for what is essentially I don't know like kind of like nine MacGuffins tied together into being like oh it's about faith I struggled with the show in two places and this is why this is why I'm sort of neither here nor there on it I thought I I, I had a hard time with the season premiere even though it had all the positive things that we're talking about pretty gory and I yeah and I thought the second episode was just terrific I really really liked yeah. it yeah Mumbai Sky Castle is that one Sky Tower Sky Tower my bad um. So, so there, there are two things here. I, I was trying to be. There's so much excitement and fun and passion being put into the show that I didn't want to dismiss it um, when it got so aggressively gory and gnarly in the first episode. Like to an almost absurd. To a, I, I'm not going to say almost to an absurd degree. It's on, to be fair. To, that is on the sticker when you buy it. Yes, but he. 
my my issue with that was, you know, I have a hard time with people who don't flinch when they murder. You know what I mean? Like that opening scene where they're in a car and everyone around them dies and people are shooting at them and it's a crazy, as you said, grindhouse thing and they're wisecracking and making jokes and they're not bothered at all. To me, that was the kind of, that, that was sort of the worst reflection of like what people disparagingly call a comic book aesthetic where I was like, well, nothing matters. If nothing matters to them and there are no stakes, then what matters? If they're laughing through this carnage mm-hmm. um i found that very off-putting because I was even just if like, you're like cassidy is a vampire like they're driving around with a vampire yeah but i was like it's just not worth it unless they actually feel something in the midst of this at some point right. if they're in if they're just completely uh, unflappable then what's the point can i make so, a counter can i just well, ask you a question yeah don't you also hate it when people are like we're good people but we did a bad thing yes here's what i'm saying i didn't stop watching you right. know i did not dismiss it out of hand what i was trying to think of was a ratio that i like you know, and I was trying to think of this as an inverse because you could say Mad Men, also on AMC, literally the only <laughs> connection you can make. So go with me, is an incredibly thinky, talky show about people's feel all the stuff I love, and then every so often a lawnmower would run over a British guy's foot, and people would be like, "Look, it could be crazy and funny too." That is a ratio. This show is the inverse of that. Gotcha. Where the whole show is, is a lawnmower running over your foot, and then. They also have on the margins something charactery, and that's fine. What what worries me long term because as soon as it goes back to the characters, just and these actors, I'm in. The second episode, which featured an angel from the first season reinventing himself as a um, basically as an immortal uh, sideshow act at a casino, mm-hmm. who goes on a eight ball bender with Cassie. I mean, it's yeah. so good. And the performances are so funny. It's filmed in such a bright. When way. you say to somebody, yeah, there's a scene where a vampire and an angel do speedballs together. Yeah, and eat ice cream. And and make a blanket fort. That sounds like you're playing uh you know, refrigerator magnet poetry with uh, you know, you know, any mm-hmm. number of 40 years of cult movies mm-hmm. and you're just like, "Oh, what if this?" Yeah. But actually the scene is super charming and sl- right. pretty emotionally like Touching, and they built because it's two incredibly lonely, immortal people who yeah. are like, we are doing this because it's so hard being us, and that's the episode worked because of it. Yeah. It built an emotional arc within the craziness that made sense to me. And here's my my concern about the show going forward, and I mean this not like this is this is good. This this is, comes from a place of good intentions. It's the same concern I actually had for the comic book, and I and I wonder if this is why I never went back to it, which is. The nagging feeling that it's basically just punk rocking it. Mm -hmm. Basically being like, it doesn't have to be anything. It just has to be like a middle finger to God and propriety and whatever. And the comic book by Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon, Garth Ennis is uh, an Irish writer who, you know, clearly has strong opinions about religion and America and violence and wrote something. I don't know how much time he spent in the South, but basically wrote his version of depravity and fun and, and pulp set in that world. Yeah. Um, well, this isn't... show seems to be saying in a very... It, it's it's not possible for it not to be deep, even if a character just siphoned gas with a human intestine, because the question is, where is God and why has he left us? What I'm saying to you is, I don't know if the people making the show care, if they really have an answer to that. That doesn't diminish my enjoyment of it in the short term, but it does make me question my investment in it long term. We've unintentionally brought up a couple of times these... Um, modern iterations of things that were essentially nerd culture from our teenage years and what felt like these really transgressive edgy things when we were younger because Mm -hmm. there wasn't something like Preacher on fucking cable, you know, or Or in humans or whatever on ABC. Those things got a lot of mileage out of their uniqueness at the time. Mm-hmm. And there's something about watching Preacher where you're like, yeah, I know, guys. Well, like even the violence, the ultra violence, I'm like, well, I bet they borrowed some of the tricks from Walking Dead. Like uh, they know how to make a skull pop yeah. like yeah. a melon now. Yeah. You know, Sopranos didn't show us when that happened in the <laughs> second last episode, but now technology is advanced that right. we can see it. Right. Cool. But we've seen it. I enjoyed. I mean, I, I I really have a good time but, watching this. But show. do you have any thoughts about that though, and how it would affect your enjoyment of it if the show is basically asking questions that it ultimately isn't interested in answering in well, a meaningful way? I don't know if the leftovers were interested in answering the same questions. The 
Well, that well, that's. I don't mean. But no, but that's, I, that's I, a good... I make it sound like that's like a checks, checkers move. I'm saying like I think we've been confronted with several shows over the last few years that raise questions in the trailer that it has no interest in answering. I shouldn't have used question and answer because that's a fraught sure. s- setup. What sure. I mean is the the leftovers to me was a very powerful and profound, you know, especially in the end. Good, About all the good, stuff that you say. Good faith examination of what's the point. Yeah, no pun intended. What What's the point yeah. of any of this? Yeah. Um, Preacher is a hell of a lot of fun, which, by the way, Dainu, that's probably enough mm-hmm. with these amazing performances. But it, at its heart, what is motivating them, the questions they are asking, like, you need to have some ballast there. And I don't know if they even care. You know, I, and, I, and I don't even mean that dismissively, but the, at a certain point, the bells and whistles and the WTFs, like the preacher, the, the the other preacher who has a girl in a cage, and they're all like laughing about it a little bit. It's like, come on, guys. Like you don't need to – at a certain point, the bells and whistles have to quiet down. You have to have something there. Right. I think I like it more than you. I think obviously it bothers me less than you. But I think that we're both saying the same thing, which is that the uh, replacement level yeah. of the character – like if you put actors who are replacement oh level good in those roles, yeah. I don't know if the show – like gets on the air and listen, like like we're gonna look back at ruth nega being on this show like george clooney on er we're gonna be like i can't yeah. believe that was like george clooney was on television every thursday like I know. it's gonna be the same thing I, when she's like a, a big big star in three years it's gonna be really cool that she was also on three or four seasons of preacher i i loved watching the second episode it was really fun you know i i just i, I enjoyed it because it was having fun so I realize I'm, if it sounds disingenuous that I'm saying thank you for being fun and not being too heavy, but also why aren't you being heavier? I, I just I'm saying I think you're saying that like they go they, there's a couple of times where they're like no one will tell us what to do, so we're gonna do it. I, I also feel like I want I, I have very high standards now. I guess now that I'm no longer a critic, like I love that they're getting away with this. I love that they seem to be able to get away with anything. Mm-hmm. I love that they have this cast. I think that that Rogan and Goldberg are really really smart guys who know what people like and know what they like and have proven themselves to be surprisingly. Good I'm actually directors. super excited because also I if I had to guess if you had asked me ten years ago what would a Seth Rogan directed work look like i wouldn't have guessed it had this kind of verve you just think it would be martin star with pink eye yeah or just like a very flat like improv improv comedy this is very written it's very timed the rhythms of the show are very defined do we ever talk about this is the end on this podcast That Um, that movie was really good that movie was incredible that movie was but that movie is literally let's throw a party and tape a bunch of it and see what the best parts are but was better didn't get enough credit for doing something that the, all the Apatow movies, whether they are good or bad, get credit for, which is in spite of the giant demon dong, this movie is actually has something to say about yeah. friendship. Yes. Yes. Ultimately, the same message that a lot of those movies have, which is that it's time to grow up. You know? Yeah. Time to grow up and don't let Aziz Ansari fall into a hell mouth. <laughs> that's right. Those, that's just life advice. OK, we're going to be back on have Monday you, with a special episode. Have you finished Master of None yet? Yeah. Did you? Damn. What, do you want to just do a little master right now? No, I haven't finished it. I was hoping you'd say no, and I'd be like, cool, maybe we should talk about how we haven't finished it. I'm ready. I, I, but I, I, I haven't finished I'm, it. I'm ready when you are. Thanks, man. Very, I, yeah. I bet our listeners are, too. A lot of ambiguity. Is there? Yeah. Uh, we will talk on Monday. We're going to do uh, a barbecue playlist that will go up pretty yeah, shortly just after ser- this Thursday Search episode. my name on Spotify. I'm we'll tweet it out. out. Maybe we can get Zach Mack to tweet it out from his podcast, um, from his Twitter account. From Zach Mack's personal podcast? From Zach Mack. Maybe Zach Mack can do a personal podcast when he does all his podcasts. Zach, what would your podcast be called? Mack Attack. Come on. That's you're the branding guru. That's not as good as Mack Attack. That's very college radio. Yeah. That's true. We're going to workshop that. Okay. All right. (laughs) I want everyone out there to have a great holiday weekend. You guys, happy birthday, America. Keep it together. Keep it together, America. Going um, great, by the way. There's a, a special episode of The Watch on Monday, the playlist, the Don Winslow episode. We'll be back Thursday with a special guest and hopefully talking some baby driver. And 444, light them firecrackers, Baranski. Before then, don't let your babies drive. Is that what the movie's about? Yeah. Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by Redbox. School is out for summer. Redbox has the video games to keep you entertained since your education has come to a close for temporarily. Also, just summer in gen for the kid inside. Get those video games, man. With over 40,000 locations nationwide, you can rent and return anywhere. Better yet, 
you'll get fr- a free one night game rental from Redbox when you use the promo code WATCH2. Watch number two. Swing by a box in your neighborhood, or if you want to make sure the game you want is there when you arrive, reserve it online at redbox.com slash games. Offer is valid through July 13th, 2017, subject to additional terms. Charges apply for additional nights, and a payment card is required. Getting into video games has never been so easy. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Carvana. Looking to unsuck the experience of going to the dealership? Then Carvana can help. With Carvana, you can browse, buy, trade in, and finance your next vehicle online from the comfort of your own home. Choose as soon as next day delivery or pick up your vehicle from the world's first coin-operated car vending machine and wave bye-bye to buyer's remorse with their seven-day money-back guarantee. Go to Carvana, C-A-R-V-A-N-A dot com slash watch for the new way to buy a car. 